That Great Business Show. Winner, Highly Commended Award. Irish Podcast Awards. Welcome to episode 181, 181 of that great business show, home of great business tips, insights, and opportunities on every episode, delivered as usual in our commute friendly package. Unlock the full potential of your business with Mentors Work, Ireland's award winning, fully government funded mentoring program designed to fuel the growth of your business, no matter the sector or size. Mentors Work will help transform your business by providing tailored guidance through one on one mentoring sessions, upskilling workshops, as well as networking opportunities. Together with your mentor, you'll also craft a customized six month business plan to propel your business forward. Try it and test it, and already empowering over 3,000 Irish businesses. Register for free today on mentorswork.ie. I'm Conal O'Mora and Fautistiach on this episode. Anyone for pizza? A husband and wife team making dough from pizzas. I know it's a bit obvious. And if luxury is your thing, we are joined by an extraordinary young Irish woman who is making famous brand names like Paco Rabanne, Jean-Paul Gaultier and Nina Ricci even more famous. She shares some of her best-kept secrets with us. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It has taken me a while to get her, but what a guest to get. Ashley McDonnell is a true world player in digital marketing with extensive experience in the world's leading tech and luxury groups, including Google, LVMH and Pooch, where she's currently the global digital media and e-commerce director. And if you don't know it, Spanish company Pooch is the owner of some of the world's best known luxury scents and perfume brands. Ashley is also a board member of multiple startups and serves as the chairperson of the board at Digital Business Ireland, the nation's representative body on technology for businesses. She's also a founder of the top 10 business fashion and beauty podcast, Tech Powered Luxury. Ashley McDonald, welcome to That Great Business Show. Hi, Connell. Thank you for having me. How long was it trying to get you here? I don't know. I think I was trying to get on to you to begin with, but <laughs> we <laughs> I don't made it think so. <laughs> Pooch. I had never heard. It's spelled P-U-I-G for anybody who wants to look it up. It's a fascinating company. Family owned. Mm. Tell me all about it. Absolutely. It is a really impressive company. It's over 120 years old now, so it's in its third generation. And it's a big player in the field of luxury goods, in particular fashion and beauty but it's really dominant in the beauty side of things, especially fragrance. So the group, it's it's still family owned, although recently announced, perhaps there's going to be an IPO this year. But it's really a group that owns, operates, markets and distributes a large portfolio of luxury brands. And a lot of people, especially in Ireland, wouldn't be familiar with the structure of luxury groups and that luxury brands are, for the most part, owned by a handful of groups around the world. So Pooch is one of those. And they have Charlotte Tilbury, Paco Rabanne, Jean-Paul Gaultier, Carolina Herrera, Nina Ricci, you'd mentioned. Recently, we acquired Byrido and Dr. Barbara Strum, which is a really uh, innovative skincare brand. So yeah, we have a big for- portfolio of brands and we create fragrance for a lot of other companies as well. Turnover, 3.5 billion. We're talking about a family company here. Mm-hmm. And net profits, two years ago, of 400 million. Yeah. And I'm guessing from the trajectory of sales growth, that's going to be exceeded quite hugely very when, when the next uh, results are announced. Yeah, so the 2022 revenues, like you said, three three 3.6 billion euro even, exceeded what the goals were for 2023. So financial results for this uh, past year have not come out yet, but we exceeded them a year in advance anyways in terms of our objectives. And they tell me that it's all down to you. 
Um, <laughs> can't take credit for that, but... <laughs> You've got a dirty, great big job there. Yeah. Digital media and e-commerce director. Yeah, I was made director just before I turned 30. So I was really, really proud of that. I didn't expect that to ago, happen, to be honest. Well, I just turned 30 in October, so it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> um, so I was made director in around March last year. That is a superb e- achievement. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, you obviously did a bit or you got it because you've done exceptional stuff. Yeah, it was it was quite interesting. And, you know, when I first applied for a role at Pooch, um, which was just about three and a half years ago, within 10 minutes, I got an automatic rejection from HR. And I really thought, you know what, I actually think I'm a good fit for this role. So I followed up because although it was an automatic template, I had the email of the person. And I just replied with my CV and said, I'd really love to chat. And within five days, I had the offer and I moved to Switzerland. Get away. Yeah. <laughs> that is a great story to tell people to say, don't give up. Don't give up. I mean, it's not the first time I've done that. And usually they reply and say, no, we, we don't want to follow up with an interview. <laughs> But it's fine. Like, and you what get did you used change in your the the, the, the um, CV that you sent through? Honestly, nothing. And it was like the description for the job was written for me. They wanted a native English speaker that could speak French and perhaps a bit of Spanish and Italian. Someone that had experience in digital, but also in luxury brands. And at that point, I was at Google and I'd spent you know a couple of years there managing the LVMH portfolio. And before that had been at LVMH and Dior. So I was really like word for word, exactly what they needed. But were you Google Art in Dublin here? or Yeah, I came you? back to Ireland for two years, um, but I managed luxury, the and luxury portfolio. So. does that mean that you manage the portfolio? Well, this is honestly, that's kind of my bread and butter. It's looking at internally normally. So I was normally in-house pre and post Google. But how do luxury brands leverage digital media to drive exposure, engagement, community, and of course, conversion, so sales. And the luxury groups are some of the biggest spenders in media around the world. You see it in out-of-home advertising. So whether it's at a bus stop or in magazines or the more traditional marketing, but that has moved. So imagine for Pooch pre-pandemic, you know, most of the advertising budgets were spent on TV commercials and really the traditional media, but now about 50% of budgets are spent on digital. So you need people in-house that understand how to do that, whether it's YouTube ads or search ads, how you spend money with TikTok, with Snap, all these major digital players. So that's what I do. And everybody and anybody listening, they want to know what works. Yeah. What does work? (laughs) Um, There's not a one fits all approach. And today it's so technical and it's so siloed and it's really, really tough. And I see it with Irish businesses. That's why I joined the board of Digital Business Ireland to help Irish businesses understand how they can have effective media spend. Um, And in particular, when it comes to driving brand awareness, you need to really look at things from, am I doing this to drive brand or am I doing this to drive sales? And if you focus too much on one or the other, in the short term and the long term, you're going to have issues. So if you only focus on brand short term, you're not going to have much sales, most likely. And if you only focus on conversion, that can have great short term results. But long term, it means people are only buying from you because you've been really pushing a hard sale. So it's finding that right balance. So we really look at everything from the approach of building brand versus driving sales. And they're two different budgets. They have very different objectives. And I think every company needs to have that approach of what drives brand awareness and brand, let's say, loyalty and brand love versus what's going to actually drive sales at key commercial periods or key moments in someone's life. And what does drive the love? What drives the love is creating connection and emotion. And what we see in luxury, especially when it comes to beauty, is leaning into fashion can be a huge help. So if you look at all the major fashion players in the world, whether it's Dior or Chanel, Giorgio Armani, Yves Saint Laurent, they're really big established, we'd say heritage brands and they're fashion houses, right? But what drives their revenue is beauty. And that's the scalable product. That's the product that's also more affordable. So even though, let's say it's the fashion house that you think of and that you maybe aspire to be a part of in terms of community, most likely you're going to buy a fragrance or a lipstick or something like that. So that's why it's important to to look at both. And at Pooch, they do that very well. If you look at Jean-Paul Gaultier, Carolina Herrera, Paco Rabanne, those brands are all in the you know top of the charts in terms of fragrance sales globally. Um, so yeah, that's a really key And the word element. globally is very useful segue because one of the issues that I keep thinking of, what might work in Ireland or the UK, mm-hmm. does it work in France? Does it work in Germany, Japan or wherever else? Are you yeah. in 150 countries that I read? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. So the way most luxury groups are structured, because before I was at LVMH and it was um, very similar, but LVMH is even bigger. They're the biggest luxury group in the world. Um, so the way you do it is you have your global headquarters and nearly all major luxury groups are headquartered in Paris. So L'Oreal, LVMH, Kering, Pooch, 
uh, Koti and many more. So if you're global headquarter, and then you have what you'd call your markets. And in Pooch, we're in over 26 markets. So 26 countries where we have offices with localized teams. And sometimes they cover a region. So we have an office in Miami, which is a regional hub for the Americas. We have one in Germany, which covers the DAC region. Um, so you don't always have to have one in every single country. For example, now we're really expanding into Asia. So we have hubs in Southeast Asia, for example. And it's in each of those countries that the teams will localize the strategy. So they'll have local media focus, work with local influencers, local publishers, uh, whatever is most relevant in that region. But that means that the director, i.e. you, <laughs> have got to focus on 26 different units. Mm. That's a lot of work. It's a lot. And I think the advantage you have in luxury is even your employees should love your brand, right? So you build real community and real loyalty internally as well. And I've I've seen it in all the luxury brands that I've worked with, and they're the ones that really, really succeed. If if they have internally people that are so passionate about the brand, then you're not going to have an issue. And um, especially in Paris, I nearly everyone I come into contact with that works in business, they either want to or are already working in the luxury industry. It's huge. And when you are hiring or choosing, mm. how did you find out that they actually really, really love that they're not just saying, I love whatever the brand is, Paco Rabanne? Yeah. Well, normally you have to make a lot of sacrifices to get into industries that have a huge, let's say, supply of talent and a limited supply of jobs. So even myself, I had to go through the usual process, which is a lot of internships. Um, luxury groups hire, especially if you look at the headquarters in Paris, from very specific, uh, small selection of business schools, if you're on the business side, but same on fashion. So for me, I knew I needed to get into specific schools if I wanted to even be hired for the internship that I wanted. And when you want a really good internship, you need to be at a master's level as well. So I couldn't get my LVMH internship until I was enrolled in a master's, for example. I'd been applying for years. That's kind of the, the motto of my story is just like, keep applying for things, keep trying and you'll get there eventually. And, and you went to a gap. business school in France somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. So I did double degree with DCU, global business and French. That was amazing. And then that got me into a business school in France. So I did two years in each, um, Naoma Business School. And you do everything through French there, which helped me get those first internships, but still not the level that I'd wanted to be at. Not quite the LVMHs or the L'Oreal's or the Pooch, you know, level of luxury. But I was in a fashion tech startup, for example. So that helped me kind of close the gap. And then when I got into my master's at HEC, uh, my first week was with the former CEO of Louis Vuitton, uh, Vincent Bastien. And then that really led me to then landing my role six months later with LVMH. So yeah, there's a very specific path. And if you follow it, you're almost guaranteed to get in. <laughs> but the bit that you've left out is that you actually wanted to be a fashion designer. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and you also got into various fashion design schools. Yeah. Yeah. My leave and start year, that was my main focus. So I was very, I would say, relaxed around the entire exams and whatnot, because I knew I had my place anyways in, in the various fashion schools. I didn't take a year out to do the portfolio. I did it kind of over midterms and stuff, went off on a couple of art retreats. So that was my goal, actually, fashion design. And then come from a family of entrepreneurs. So we kind of said, OK, maybe the business route is the best way to go for it. No, them. you were told. Yeah, kind of. Well, it was, uh, <laughs> I think the fashion dream was uh, a bit of a crazy one growing up, you know, in, in rural Ireland where it's, I, I didn't really even know if it was an industry, but I'm glad I went from the business side of things because it's been an amazing experience. Well, it's rocking now. So back yeah. to sharing your secrets. <laughs> what, what is working these days? Because one of the, another, one of my, the many things I think about yeah. is, keeps moving. So mm. Instagram, TikTok, blah, 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 blah. Who, what? What's your, what, what's your preferred outlet at the moment? Again, we look at that from a market perspective. So right now um, I have a big focus on China. So I just got back from Shanghai. I spent a week there meeting all the different major tech platforms and social media platforms in the region. And it's incredible what has happened kind of during and post COVID. They've become much more inner focused, much more about local brands, but also local platforms. So anyone looking to do business in China, it's all about the live stream. So we have two of our brands that live stream technically 24 hours a day. Um, so Christian Louboutin and Penhaligans, we have two parallel live stream studios with two different people or sometimes groups of people live streaming about our brands on TikTok. So the Chinese TikTok, actually the original one, which is called Douyin and on Tmall, which is kind of the equivalent of Amazon, but more luxury. <laughs> You've actually stopped me talking there. <laughs> Live streaming yeah. 24 hours a day. Talking yeah. about what? Talking about the products, talking about the brand. And it works. Oh, if you on, don't man. activate your live stream, you're not, you're not 
present, basically. Yeah. So what do they, physically, what do they literally talk about? I mean, if you're talking, yeah. I mean, let's choose Paco Rabanne because it's one mm. I know. Yeah. How could you talk about that for 24 hours? It's, yeah, it's quite incredible, to be honest. So we build out scripts. We hire people that are almost like actors, but that can sell. So it's kind of, let's say, the new digital version of a sales assistant. And that's their role. It's to be online all day long. Um, so 12 hours a day per platform, per brand. So that's why we've basically 24 hours a day of content uh, per brand, all day, every day. But sorry, are your actors sitting there for 12 hours? Yakking they get away? breaks. So the other oh, day when good. I was uh, taking a look, I was like, oh, no one's there right now. They're gone. They're gone to the bathroom. Um, but yeah, so we have, it's for Christian Louboutin and Penhaligans. They're the two brands that we've launched it for so far in China, but we will roll it out for, for more. And they talk about the product. They talk about the history of the brand. They showcase everything. If people are asking questions, they're looking for a gift. They're trying to find the right, the right perhaps fragrance or lipstick shade. So it's it's totally normal in China. <laughs> well, and presumably coming to a live streaming place near you, um, is this going to roll out across the world now with you guys? Honestly, I really think the consumer behavior is so different in China ah, and we're so okay. behind in terms of technological advancements. You know, we used to look uh, to the West. Uh, we used to look to Silicon Valley for tech and for software inspiration. But now we need to look at China. They're so advanced. They just move so fast. And you obviously measure everything. Everything, yeah. And so you're live streaming. What what results are they showing? Normally selling a product at least every 90 seconds, if not more. So, and these are high price items. These are luxury items. So yeah. retailing at? Like, let's say a lipstick from Christian Louboutin. It's really high price, but one of the most expensive in the world. It's at around 100 euros. Okay, I'll have 10, please. Yeah. <laughs> and that can happen. People want multiple shades or they want to collect them, especially if there's limited edition. So that does work really well in, in luxury. So in China, live stream, that's really key. And e-commerce doesn't really work in China in the way that it works in the rest of the world, like direct to consumer, you know, your website.com or whatnot. What works in China is working with the major uh, e-commerce um, partners. So um, basically e-concession so being present either on JD, which is Jingdong, it's technically the biggest retailer in the world, actually, um, because they own the stock, or on uh, Tmall. So Tmall and JD, they're the two main places where you're going to drive um, growth for online sales in China. And so move away from China across to some of the other bigger markets for you. Uh, move east the to the Middle East. That's a big uh, area of growth right now. And again, it's very different. Like Snapchat oh. is the main platform for media. And how do you use Snapchat in the Middle East? I guess with all social, when it comes to luxury, you have two ways of, well, three ways of leveraging media, earned, owned and paid media. So earned media is people talking about you. So we want people to talk about us and in a positive way. And we don't want to be the only people talking about our brands. And how do you make that happen? Well, you can work with influencers, for example. So technically you might be paying them, but still for us, it falls under earned media. And that's really key in the Middle East because Instagram is actually less popular there because people want to be able to have a direct one on one conversation and for it to be very private. They don't want to be leaving a public comment on a post. So that's very specific to the region, but it's really important. And who teaches you all of this stuff? Yeah, it's hard to stay on top of it. I think that's why I started my own podcast, to be oh. honest, because I get to interview experts in very specific areas of the fields um, that, that I work in. So I had a major influencer from the Middle East come on the podcast and, and talk me through it. And it was absolutely fascinating. And then that episode went to number one in fashion and beauty in every country in the Gulf region. So even locally, people are quite fascinated as to how, how these things work. So the, the talk that the influencer thing is over is definitely not true. <laughs> it's not true no no we I think really the UK need is suggesting that the influencer thing is yeah over, I hear yeah. this all the time and I'm like you know maybe for certain ways of working it doesn't make sense anymore and for certain product categories or industries but in luxury they're so important I think there always have been people of influence within the luxury field you know before it was more let's say actors and musicians and we're probably coming back to that now as well uh, but no influencers are really really important now, back to the English-speaking world. So mm. that'll be Ireland, UK, US. Yes. What's working there? Um, so it's a little bit, I would say, more straightforward because you can see what's happening in China and in the Middle East. It's, it's kind of hard. It's not easily accessible, these different platforms for language reasons, but also because it's more behind the scenes. Um, Instagram is still really important for Western Europe, like really, really important. So again, earned, owned and paid media. So earned influencers, we have big pools of influencers for each brand. And within each brand, we have them for specific product categories and product lines. So if we take Paco Rabanne, we have many different product lines. We have One Million, which is the most famous one. Uh, we have Invictus. And then we have all the female fragrances as well. 
fame, for example. So we won't use the same influencers in general for a fame fragrance versus uh, for the Olympia fragrance, because we really want to find influencers that align with those specific product lines. That's the earned side. So influencers, both product seeding, so sending products out to people, getting it in their hands. Uh, campaigns. Does that work? Yes. Yeah. You need to always keep your community alive um, if you're not gifting them somebody else's anyway. So it's good, especially if you know they like a specific product from you, make sure they never run out and they'll be loyal. <laughs> <laughs> when you phone them up and say, how are you doing with your pack of Rubin? Oh, no, we're constantly in contact. Like it's proper community management when it comes to influencers. How many people are at work under you? Well, at Pooch, there are eight and a half thousand people. So they're No, I mean just, you directly. So I'm at group level, group level, all brands, fashion and beauty. And within each individual brand, I work with their digital teams. So we could have 500 people on digital at a global level. Yeah. And then within each market as well, we have dedicated digital people. So it's a How big chunk of the all? company. Um, Workplace is amazing. So Workplace is the platform powered by Facebook. And I don't know how we would have done it before that, to be honest, because when I arrived, luckily Facebook Workplace already existed within the organization. So I can very easily look up someone and see their entire organization, where they sit, who reports to them, where, where they are physically as well in the world. So that's a really key tool in a big organization. When I was at LVMH, we did not have that. And organograms where you can see kind of the layout of, of teams and whatnot were literally forbidden within the company. It was so mysterious. And I, was in really? a, yeah, and I was in a global team arriving into Dior from the LVMH group level, but specifically then internal move into Dior. And I remember HR sitting me down and drawing on paper and I needed to remember over a thousand people's names. And I was like, I can't even see their faces. And I'm working with teams in the regional hubs of Paris, of Dubai, of Singapore, of Miami. It was really challenging and at the beginning. And why the secrecy? I think it's just the way the industry runs, to be honest. It always is like that. Um, but you know, Pooch obviously does it differently and very successfully. Yeah, I think Pooch is, the, the brands are more modern. Most of the Pooch brands, the original founders are still alive and still working within the brand. That's really different to a lot of the other groups. And I feel like we have, yeah, a very young and innovative reputation as a brand, as a group and within our brands. What is the hidden special power that people should use in terms of fellows or people listening to this podcast who say, just the whole marketing thing is too much for me. Mm. If you were to choose just your one favorite platform or app or whatever, what would you say? You've got to use this. It's a really good question. First of all, I think if you're not in love with marketing, but it's it's key for your business, hire someone that does love it. That's a really important thing to do because it's if so If you're key. an SME, you probably can't afford to. You have to do your own accounts, make the tea and do the marketing. Yeah, then I would say find the platform that you maybe hate the least, <laughs> because at least you could just hone in on that one. But I but, used to love Twitter and Twitter's yeah, bust now. I mean, it's just, exactly. And that's, it's I think a lot of people have an issue with that yeah. because that was the one that they were, they felt safe within and they knew how to use it. And all of a sudden they're like, I don't want to be here. It's not a positive space. Yeah. And in that sense, I would say, well, threads is sadly not quite there yet, but fingers crossed something can happen there. Um, Instagram, I feel like is a great one to start out with. Because you can just post visuals or you can start learning about video content. And I would say one app to learn how to use is CapCut. So it's actually owned by like the TikTok group, but it's a really easy to use app. Like it's on your phone and you can edit videos. Um, it's what I've been using now for the last six months. And I think it's uh, the best way for everyone to start creating video content. C-A-P-C-U-T? Yeah, CapCut. I must have a look at that it's one. It's really, really, really good. Yeah. And I also saw, because you better give your own podcast a big shout out, which is called <laughs> Tech Powered Luxury, correct? Yeah. Yes. And you are now going to go videoing it. Yeah. And you know what this means to me is that what you're talking about China mm -hmm. and you're talking about your podcast, video, video, video. Video. It's in some ways the death of TV as we know it because mm -hmm. TV died in China a long time ago Did because it? of this okay. yeah everyone watches the live stream that's most specific <laughs> to their interest at that moment you know you can watch anything I was in um, different MCN so multi-channel network agencies while I was there uh, everyone arrives into the office at 10 or 11 a.m they don't leave until 1 a.m and they're all they're the behind the scenes people controlling what's going on in these thousands of live streams across China so that's the new TV it's kind of frightening yeah. It's just TV that has moved to smaller screen and you just watch what you want on demand. That's really specific to you. And you can interact. That's, I think, the beauty of it. You direct interaction with the hosts, which you can't have on TV. Which is, of course, the future as well. Yeah. Mm. So mm. Where, what's the, what about the future of Pooch? And, what, and more importantly, the future of you and Pooch? <laughs> so I've just moved actually to the Paris office after being 
three years in Switzerland, which was very quiet. <laughs> Why so. is the HQ in Paris? Just because it uh, used to be Barcelona. So yeah. technically, the yeah, historical headquarters, it's, it's still in Barcelona. And we just announced, I think yesterday, or the day before, a new tower. So the Torre Puch, it's a huge tower. Uh, and now we've opened a second one. Uh, so the company is expanding quite fast. Um, however, in Paris, we have the individual headquarters for quite a few of the brands. So the French brands, basically, we never move the headquarter of a brand. So Jean-Paul Gaultier, Christian Louboutin, Paco Robin, Nina Ricci, they're all French brands. L'Artisan Parfumeur is another niche fragrance brand we have. Whereas you'll have Penhaligans and Charlotte Tilbury, they're London headquarters. Carolina Herrera, New York. So you have the headquarter office of the fashion house there. By Rido is between... Uh, Stockholm and Paris. That's the way it was pre-acquisition and that won't change. So yeah, we have a lot of offices around the world, basically. You travel a lot, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot. How many days? Uh, I'd say last year, probably two thirds of the year I was traveling. It was a lot, yeah. I had Tony Smurfett on episode 16, I think. And I think he's told me he spends 260 days a year in the sky. Yeah, I might be getting close to that now. But also I, I spent a lot of time working in the travel retail side of things. So it's it's part of the job and it's a, it's a key component of the industry. Well, you have made it basically to the top of the tree. How, what's your next big step? Well, I definitely don't feel like I've made it to the top of the tree, but I've made it back to Paris, which oh, was key. Now. You are a director <laughs> yeah. of a very successful company. Yeah. No, it's... And you're still very young. Yeah, I've still got a lot of energy and I've got a lot of ideas. So I still, I feel oh, like it's the beginning. Ideas. Tell us what, tell us what <laughs> you're going to do. Um, well, I think we're, we're moving into a new phase of technology. So last week it was NFT Paris week. This week is fashion week. And always between those two weeks, they have a couple of days with a big focus on, on luxury and tech. So I moderated a panel on fashion, art and culture on the blockchain with four incredible visionaries who are founders of four different organizations that leverage blockchain within fashion, art and culture. And the day before that, I attended the Future Fashion Summit. And I really feel like we're just on the cusp of a, a big of change. Of what though? What, what will the big change be? It's going to be moving towards blockchain technologies for the luxury industry in particular. Now explain to that to the uninitiated. Okay. So blockchain, basically it's putting things on a ledger. So imagine, let's take a Chanel handbag as the product that we want to put on a ledger. Today, Chanel... And you've had a couple of guests on the, the podcast who've spoken about um, resale and the whole secondhand market, especially, you know, pre-loved for luxury. Today, who authenticates that sale? So let's say I have a Chanel bag. I bought it 10 years ago and I want to sell it now. I make a profit. Great investment. Where do I sell it? There's many platforms you can sell it on. Who do I sell it to? There's even more people out there that want to buy it. How does that person know that they have an authentic bag? And today, a couple of platforms step in and say, we'll tell you that it's real and we'll take a big fee from both the seller and the buyer to make sure that it's real. eBay has a full team doing that at the moment, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. eBay, Vestiaire Collective, Vinted have an option for authentication as well. So you can pay an extra fee to make sure it goes through that process. You know, you can't use Vinted in Ireland. So yeah, you know it's that. such a pity. It's, it's an strange. amazing platform, huge in France, absolutely yeah. huge. Um, but to be honest, the only people that can really say if the product is actually authentic or not are people from the brand. And they are not involved in that equation today. So I really think every luxury item that's going to be produced in the future before it goes out into the world, even before it arrives in store, it's going to have to have a digital ID and be authenticated in advance. And then that gets rid of all those issues later on down the line. And it facilitates being able to sell the product as well in a very easy way. Because you have the digital ID, you pop it into whatever platform you want. We know that it's real. You get that product at home and no more issues. That was something we looked into a lot last week, actually, and how EU regulations are going to be changing. Um, digital IDs are going to be required for all goods actually sold in the EU, most likely in the next couple of years. And I think luxury is ripe for that disruption. So the old dodgy market is about to disappear, the black yes, market. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah? yeah. Okay. Listen, I could literally talk to you all day, but <laughs> we have time constraints. Your final question, you know what I'm going to ask you. Yes. Who would Ashley McDonald hire in a heartbeat? So I have two people. I spoke with both of them today. Oh, good. Um, I know they exist. Yes, they've both been interns with me. They've both done a six-month internship each with me. They survived. Um, and their names are Alicia O'Connell and Amy Jafari. They're both incredible Irish women, super young, very talented. And Alicia is currently doing her second internship now after Tech Powered Luxury at Chanel in their headquarters in Paris, across the street from my office. I'm so proud of her. And Amy is actually enrolled now in an incredible master's program with Schema Business School. She just finished the first semester in New York and is now in Paris as well. So very proud of them and two I'll be women, hiring them for sure. <laughs> two women to keep an eye out on. Absolutely. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. Mm. Two great choices. And 
<laughs> Maybe if Alicia or Amy want to come on to the podcast, we'd love to have a chat with them. Really good idea because yeah. they are the future. And I love that. Well, I'm looking at you. You're not exactly <laughs> an old person yourself. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you for having me. That Great Business Show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. That great business show. Winner, highly commended award. Irish Podcast Awards. We love a good business case study on That Great Business Show, the kind of business that is accessible to all our listeners, businesses that you could say, I could do that. Better still, we love it even more when the owners of those types of businesses join us here at TGBSHQ and spill the beans, tell us warts and all, how the business works, what hasn't worked, and probably in the face of many problems, why they keep on trucking. On this episode, we have our really tasty one. If you go into most of the bigger supermarket chains, as well as many smaller food stores, and head for the chilled cabinets, you're very likely to see there Pizza del Piero, pizza bases. When I found out that the pizza bases are made by a small Irish family-run business, I want to know more, like how they have managed to build a brand, how they've survived against imports, how, 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 the usual things for me. So, let me introduce the Pizza de Piero team. There is a bread, bread maker supreme, Gian Piero de Valier, I think, but he's also known as Piero. And then there is Clean Swan, who is also known as Signora Piero. <laughs> <laughs> I've, worked, I've worked on this script, believe me. <laughs> Piero, Clina, welcome to that great business show. Thank you. I think... It's an odd thing to say, but yours is a recognised Irish brand name now. Piero, tell us all about why why pizza bases. You are, were, you started very, very early as a bread maker. Yeah. 15. So, yeah, I was 15, yeah. Uh, I grew up uh, in Italy and I'm Italian. And uh, I, was working, <laughs> <laughs> I was working a family business there. Uh, not my family, but as a second in charge. After 10 years, I decided to leave the country and go for other adventures. So I decided to go to London and then I worked for uh, Berkey Spice, uh, where I learned other methods, French methods, other sourdough and uh, more things for my business. And then also I met Kleena. Uh, 22 years ago. 22 years ago. <laughs> and then you came to? And then we, we went to Galway. For a year, where I go, I work for a bakery, uh, Jimmy Griffin's, and then we moved to Dublin. I work for other bakeries, uh, and uh, I always on me I felt like I need to do something for myself. Now, isn't that funny? That's the itch, isn't it? That yeah. is the entrepreneur's itch. Yeah. Lovely to do it for others, but really something inside we tries knew it your had mind. to happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so did both of you say together, yeah. "Let's do this." Oh, yeah. No, but you were not a baker cleaner, were you? No, no, no. But yeah. we, we, I knew that he had to work for himself. It wasn't, it wasn't an option. <laughs> Let me go down the usual little rabbit hole. Did you know that Pavarotti's dad was a bread maker? Did you know that? No, I didn't. That was that was the family business was making bread, and I think he was a, uh, a oh, very, very yeah. keen. There you go. Now, can you sing? I can't. Well, well, I Right. I'll do something on the shower. There, I don't know if it's singing or... So you are working away with four other people and then you decide the itch gets too much, you have to scratch it. Mm. And what was the decision? What happened? Where were you? We were getting married. Just to make it even more yeah. difficult. Yeah. So the year previous to getting married, we got married in 2007. Pierre is half Slovenian. So we decided to get married in Slovenia, uh, somewhere kind of neutral. But in the year previous to that, he'd been testing out pizza bases and we wanted to do bread as well. But we knew that pizza bases were something that yeah. was really special. Well, at the beginning, Ireland. it was formal for ourselves just to have a nice meal. 
And then from there, um, you know, invite your friends for dinner. And then they say, you know, you could really sell this. There's so nothing else. it's just a bug. But yeah. your, your pals Invented. will always tell you that, oh, this is the best steak I've ever had. You should really go become a, a yeah. chef or something. Would, yeah, well, it has to steak, be a little bit more scientific than that. Well, the, the steak, you just buy it and, and cook it. But the pizza base, you have to make it uh, and cook it yourself. Because you, your bases are sardo yeah. and they are left to prove for oh, two days. Two is days, it days yeah. 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 Mixed notes. and remixed. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sourdough starters. So they're already pre-digested. So they're much kinder to your tummy that way, you know. Now, the problem with that is low barriers to entry. Other people can and do, I've seen them, I do, I promise you, use your pizza bases, mm -hmm. but others I can see oh, as yeah. well. Yeah, and they, that's a bloody hassle, isn't it? Yeah, but initially when we began, they, there weren't any other pizza bases. There was awful thin stuff, which is horrible, it was dry and everything yeah, else. Yeah, they weren't necessarily fresh. Oh, they weren't so, definitely yeah, fresh. <laughs> yeah, so we were the only, we were the first ones to the market on the fridge shelf, in the fridge aisle. And who was the first in, who took you first? As in, which, can you remember? Oh, Fallon which and Byrne uh, was the first. Yeah, well, before Bridge. that, there was uh, Paolo, Bottega di Paolo, that's long gone. Yeah, with, uh, the Italian Quarter. The Italian Quarter. Yeah. Oh, right. That yeah. was my very first customer. And it was kind of handy because the kitchen was around the corner there in Orkin Street from uh, Spade Enterprise. So I was trying business very close to me. We've had Spade on here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really. yeah. yeah. And you're now in Rathcool. I'm jumping around a wee yeah. bit, but you're now in Rathcool and you're now employing? 12 people full time. That's yeah. a big commitment. Yeah, but it was even more during COVID. Yeah. It was double that. Was it really? Yeah, so the yeah. place went mental for your, yeah, for your pizzas? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was more that we, we weren't able to cope with the demand and uh, the machines weren't there in place. Now we are more organized with the machines and you know, we but are keeping not, up. That's the eternal problem, mm. though. Supply, demand, supply, oh, yeah. demand, demand uh, drops off. You say, why did I buy that <laughs> machine? <Yeah>. Or <laughs> well, demand so goes through the roof. When you're planning something, it always takes probably six months to get it done. And... Um, where did your machines come from? Mainly from Italy. And, now, that's uh, yeah. I was hoping you'd say that. The m m amounts of times that I see food uh, machinery seems to, a huge amount of, comes from North Italy, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's an area there we change around where I'm from. And as well, it's easy for me to go and talk to people and see things. And, you know, <laughs> no, I understand that, that part. But the machine <laughs> just happens for reasons historic, I presume. That they that they're made there. I saw. I wonder, have you ever seen this? An egg cracking machine. I was at a. <laughs> I know. I've seen a lot of odd things in my life, but this thing was able to crack uh, eggs at a furious rate. And then I, so the lady, who was the lady who owned the, I'm trying to remember the egg business that I was talking to at the time. Anyway, she told me that it came from Italy, and somebody had gone to great trouble to be able to top and tap, tap and top an egg, and I mean hundreds of them at a furious pace. Wow. Yeah. There you go, man. So, <laughs> well, back to your business. <laughs> I have a, as I say, down the little rabbit holes yeah. I will go. So, you start out, you get married. Yeah. Now, there must have been at that stage, you're looking forward and you're saying, how are we going to fund this? Yeah. What are we going to do? What was the vision? Oh, yeah. So, it was it was a pre previous to that, a year of talking to people, asking questions, going around to everybody, because neither of us are business people. So, we didn't really know what we were doing. You what know? had you been doing? I'm a teacher. Okay. Yeah. So that was going to fund our lives for the first year while he wasn't going to make any money. And yeah. uh, that was to pay the mortgage and, you yeah. know. Peter's and when own. you say you talk to people, what did you do? So people are listening to this yeah. to say, how do I crack this so one? Crack I was lucky in that we were kind of influenced by my brother who had, who was running a business at the time as well with his friend Rick Doody, who his mother is the founder of Lear Chocolates. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, she, okay. she passed away a couple of years ago, but we did talk to her a lot about food production, manufacturing, yeah, their factory, visited yeah. the factory. And did you go you into know. a Leo or a local enterprise office? Yeah, or in Dublin City, because we were in yeah. Spade Enterprise Centre. Yeah. So we were in the Dublin City Leo at first, and then we were moving to South Dublin. We got the South Dublin Leo. and um, Did you get a mentor? Tom, yeah, initially we did have a mentor. Des was his name. It's a long time ago now. I can't remember his surname. But, you know, it was very helpful because he didn't have a clue what we were doing. He didn't yeah. get it at all. Get away. Yeah, he was just <laughs> but saying. But it's pretty basic, isn't it? No, a but he just said, why base. would I buy a base if I can just it's, buy the topped pizza yeah, in the couldn't freezer? Believe it. In he didn't see the, the reason for it, you know. Peter Rice, our station manager here, swears by your pizza bases. <laughs> His sister, he says, makes the best pizzas in the world. 
<laughs> using your pizzas. Ah. And Terry, Terry Brockman has just whispered in my ear that he uses them as well. So there you go. Everybody knows and yeah. loves the, yeah, the thing. So obviously, how did you manage to, to to build that brand? Because I can just see it in my mind's eye always. Yeah. The the Did you also change the packaging? So yeah, we did. You so see, we, I noticed that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we began as the Artisan Pizza Company mm -hmm. and it took about two years for us to realise that that name wasn't going to fit our brand. What does that mean now? Why would because it not? Because initially when we were beginning, it was 2006 to 2007 and the word artisan was still relatively unique and then it seemed that it, I saw it everywhere, you yeah. know, and I kind of felt it didn't really distinguish us yeah. clearly enough. And because Piero, it, the product really comes down to his skill and his expertise in the bakery industry. So it had to be unique to him. So Piero, the name works perfectly with pizza. Pizza da Piero means Piero's pizza. Get Italian. away, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I, I said there was a problem with budget. So at the beginning, it was just a little printer uh, from oh, yeah. 100 yeah. euro it's and very black basic. and white and yeah. stick it on and find anything just to get a product there and do the markets and, you know, get those little money to to just keep, keep going. living and yeah. running. And now you have your team in Rathcool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Is where you're based. And you're delivering to most... Of, actually, one of the reasons that you're here is you better do this and shout it out, otherwise Vivian, otherwise Vivian will go mental, is why do you want... Or sorry, what do you want from listeners? You want them to stock your pizzas. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. Simple as. Yeah. So start asking, start shouting. There, There's yeah. a lovely woman from New York called Mary Ann Pierce who gave us back in, oh, maybe eight or ten episodes ago and she gave us the New York Minute. And in New York, you ask. If you don't ask, yeah. you're a loser. <laughs> so, so start asking. <laughs> yeah, well, they're, you know, it's the perfect product for so many shops because you can you can add on, you know, your cheese and your sauce and your toppings and things like that. So whether you're a cafe or a pub or a shop, they they work for everyone. And and now pizzas are so popular. They, you know. But you are, as I mentioned, I think you're in most of the big supermarkets, yeah. though I think, did I Not see Not everywhere, this? but, you know, a lot of them. Shout out the ones who aren't. Give it, you know, make them shout. So they're not, they're not in every super value. We're, yeah. we're with Musgraves, but we're not in every single super value. So it would be great to be further around the As country. As a matter of fact, how does that work? I mean, how I would say, I don't know, ones on the uh, Western Seaboard or the Southern Seaboard not take you if, if you're there, stuck in it's Dublin. it's independently uh, run. Yeah, it? it's a choice of the manager. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. They have a list and they decide what product mm -hmm. they choose. Mm -hmm. and that's fair yeah. enough for... Okay, super yeah. value. Yeah, uh, Tesco, well, we're, we're in just about all the Tescos. Yeah. The minis are... are um, we have minis and large. Why so. did you go down the mini uh, route? Because that is a recent addition, about two uh, years it's ago. It's actually it? about five years ago oh, now. But yeah, um, they're, they haven't been everywhere, you know, so. Okay. I think, um, well, the distributor we use, the Europa Foods, and he deals with the supermarkets. And we, um, they asked me to do it. And I was very reluctant because... It's a bit of a pain to make them. It's extra <laughs> say, work, okay, you know, for smaller products. Uh, I said, okay, I'll do it. But, you know, it's a bit pricey because the work involved will take longer. Uh, and then it was small at the beginning and then it kept growing. And I suppose they're ideal for kids. Uh, oh, yeah. Ideal for yeah. kids. I mean, we use them all the time. With our people own. on a diet. Yeah. Uh, because they're yeah. Low calories and they still and have a five gram <laughs> content of protein in them. So even people who are like on their high protein diets are 125. Some people might well. just wonder about the cost. It looks, mm -hmm. you know, you buy your two pizza bases and they, they're not they, cheap. Yeah. They're, they're value. It would go value, but they're not cheap, yeah. are they? Well, no, they're not cheap, but we haven't increased the price. Um, we haven't increased the price. With all the price yeah. increase. Yeah, good that have been coming yeah. towards us, yeah. yeah. So I mean, we, we still get our to. price increases from our suppliers and our energy costs and obviously labour is, you know, cost of labour is increased. So. Now, we interviewed here a company called Delhi Lights based in Newry. I don't know whether you've ever come across them. Mm. A curious thing about Delhi Lights is that they make sandwiches in Newry that are sold in the United States. God. So I then start always wondering when I see a pizza made in Dublin, why would you not consider, or maybe you already have, shipping them to next door neighbours in the UK, up into the Northern Ireland, or, brilliant, send it to Italy. 
Any ideas, <laughs> any thoughts on that? <laughs> we have sent them to Piero's family in Italy and his sister-in-law's <laughs> love them when they get them. Um, Do they send yeah, euros no. back? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I say Italian markets is too crowded. Yeah. yeah. But have you thought of export? Oh, ah, yeah. Yes, uh, but... I'm very conservative of my steps and uh, I prefer to do Ireland better and just get every single shop before going anywhere else because I, I just think problems, you know, deliveries, uh, paperwork. I'm just on the practical side, I think we just will see. Yeah, mm. we are selling in uh, indie food in the north of Ireland now. Yeah through Sheridan's Cheesemongers. So that's... Uh, They're supportive, aren't they? Yeah, They're very supportive. They're a brilliant, yeah. organ, brilliant company yeah. altogether, yeah? yeah? Now, funding, I presume when you are expanding and you, when you need your expensive mm-hmm. Italian ma- machinery, <laughs> is that you need cash or... Yeah. Have you self-funded or...? A lot of the time we've self-funded, but yeah. we have also got supports from our local enterprise office. We were very fortunate there with Tom Rooney and... Uh, Always give them a shout out yeah. because you might have to go back again. <laughs> uh, he's very good. And um, also Enterprise Ireland for some you know, skills approved, support. You are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we just have to, you know, keep keep looking. We also, you know, use whatever uh, skills supports we can for our staff. Such you as? Know, um, the local uh, enterprise board. I'm sorry, uh, education board. English so courses. For English courses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, Supervised any, courses. Yeah, and, yeah. Any things. kind of upskilling that we can get available for our staff. Now, I said warts and all. Tell me some of the bad stuff that happened that you said, oh God, I'm going to give this up now. I'm going to go back to my bakery down in Galway or whatever. (laughs) Just Uh, any of this stuff. um, The machinery is probably the Yeah, I think uh, every stage of the the business has some challenges. So at the beginning it would be like no money or... That's always a problem. Yeah. (laughs) And then, you know, machine breaks down and then you can find staff. Uh, How are you finding staff these days? Well, lucky enough, we, we have a good team, but uh, we are struggling to get new people there. Do you need bakers or do you need... Oh, general worker general workers, and, yeah. and yeah. baker as well. Um, and you mentioned uh, English classes there, mm-hmm. which is always interesting. That's If you're bringing people in from outside, you have to start teaching them uh, mm-hmm. business English as well. As, uh, yeah. yeah, well, the, the words, uh, in the, it's easy in the workplace because it's always the same things. Yeah, uh, but when there is a problem uh, and you have to explain what's going on, uh, yeah. if there is no answer back, you know, it's kind of frustrating. So English yeah. course is good. Yeah. And was for me too because... I came in with no English. Yeah, English. literally. Uh, That's a curiosity. How did you chat initially? Uh, and I was 20, another Italian. Two years ago. <laughs> French. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a bit, a bit of wine as well helped along the way. <laughs> so further problems, machinery, uh, staff, anything else? Anything yeah. that you just said, oh, like t- talk to me through what happened at COVID. Yeah, so it was it was a high demand. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone was baking at home mm-hmm. and everyone was buying their own pizza ovens as well. So they wanted the pizza bases to go with their pizza ovens. Yeah, and the order went. The orders went uh, through the roof, literally. The roof, and the staff was coming and going. So we were like 21 people. But it was like, uh, there was no control. Like uh, were Working hours, long, very long hours. How many? 14, 16 hours a day. Um, Seven days a week? No, six days five days and then bank holidays. Sometimes we have to work an extra day. Uh, so yeah, a lot of pressure, but it's finished. And it'll never come <laughs> back. <moved. laughs> and hopefully we'll never see a COVID again. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Cleena, you mentioned earlier that you are a teacher yeah. because that's important as well because uh, you are a support teacher in St. Andrews yeah, yeah. Uh, College in Dublin here and uh, they've been really good. In yeah, terms oh, of, they've been unbelievably why, supportive. Why would they, I mean, why not, says I, but why would they be so understanding when you need to give a dig out? Well, I mean, I needed to take a, re- a career break uh, when we were maybe five years in business and we'd had our third child and Piero just couldn't, you know, make make it home, you know, to help out or whatever when I was going to be at work. So I just said, okay, this is the crunch time. I I started to get a bit more involved in the marketing side of things as well and the building of the business development. So um, I knew that I had something had to give. And so St. Andrews were very good to allow me that career break time. And also during COVID, I took parental leave, which really, really helped because it just, you know, things snowballed. So we had to 
yeah, but um, I'm a learning support and resource teacher, so I really enjoy the work and thankfully I'm back. They allowed me back <laughs> <laughs> after my time off. I'm going to give you a few final questions. What's mm-hmm. the vision? Where are you going to be in two or three years when you come back into that great business show? <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be uh, baking bread as well as pizza Is that the bases. next one, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we are there um, in Oven and I'm building a little bakery downstairs as Kind of a in Rathcoole, uh, I hope not. In in, not in the home. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's already well, there. <laughs> there is a lot at home as well. And will uh, it be in the uh, what, what will that be called? Bread de Piero? Um Whatever. Bread. Focaccia, perhaps. Focaccia, or yeah, some yeah. flat bread, or some product like that. Uh, it, it's more to keep me occupied and you know doing well, you're not things. Busy <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I need question. to be more creative uh, and just do other stuff. Yeah. Uh, maybe have another premises in the future. We'll see okay. about that. Yeah. The, the last question, and I know you've been prepped for this, is that we asked each person, so you both have to have an answer for me, mm-hmm. is who, Clina Swan, would you mm-hmm. hire in a heartbeat? So I, after not too much thought, it didn't take much for me to think about it. It was Sheila Walsh. I don't know if you've come across her. She's um, involved in inclusive leadership and uh, we took her um, support during COVID, I think, wasn't it, Pierre? Um, yeah. For some coaching and leadership. And she was just fantastic. She, well, no, she's put, an organisational psychologist. And put words she, around that. What did she actually do for you? People tell me, you know, oh, Jack Smith is a great guy. Yeah. I have to well, say. she sat down with us. She listened to us. She she heard and she understood. She she's, comes from a, a fairly mixed background as well herself. Like she, I think she'd worked in the bakeries herself. So That's useful. And restaurants. Yeah. yeah. So she really understood where and we were coming from. what did she from. change for you that you said, that is um, fantastic. She helped us to define our roles, which had become a bit enmeshed, <laughs> I think, at that stage of early COVID years. So she helped us to kind of define that and work out how to manage our, our time and our space and our energy better. Um, and then I did a course on inclusive leadership with her for over Zoom for a year. And that was really interesting. She's just published a book recently, too. So oh, good she's a really interesting person. Sheila Real, Walsh, Sheila you are Walsh. hired. Yeah. Uh, Jan Piero. Yes. To give you your full title, <laughs> <laughs> what or who would you hire in a heartbeat? Uh, I would hire uh, Jimmy Griffins from Galway. He's the guy you used to work with. I worked for him, yeah, in 2002. But you left him? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, but I, it, not for me because Cleaner couldn't get fault. a job there. <laughs> and I, I would stay until the end there. Uh, and why him and what's he good for or good at? Well, he was probably the best boss I ever had. Um, That's nice. Yeah. Uh, he's just kind. And also, he's a brilliant baker. Better than you? Uh, possibly, yeah. A lot better <laughs> in many things, yeah. <laughs> um, he's he's also has more knowledge in pastries. Uh, anything at all is part of the Irish team of baking. He's a master baker, I would call him. Uh, but all, apart from that, that I didn't know about that before, he's he just a nice man and nice boss and an inspirational person. Good for him. Yeah. Can he sing like Pavarotti? He can sing, but he can fly airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> where else would you learn that? <laughs> Listen, Cleena, Piero, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on that great business show.com. That great business show. And that's it for episode 181 of That Great Business Show Great Business Insights and Inspiration. Regular listeners know that we're true believers in business mentors, so make sure to check out mentorswork.ie to unlock the full potential of your business. It's a fully government-funded mentoring program designed to fuel the growth of your business, no matter the sector or size. Do sign up as well for email updates, and we will send you your own personal copy of the podcast at thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Share, like, 
give us five star reviews. It really, really does help. And advertise with us, of course, that great business show, to engage with our incredible audience of entrepreneurs, businesses, business owners, business wannabes, investors, nosy people, all kinds of people. We love them all. And we record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, where today's studio engineer is Alison O'Dwyer, or Alison O'Delightful, as her friends call her. Later, the dynamic duo of studio manager Peter Rice and post-production engineer Neil Horner ensure that we remain the world's best-sounding business podcast. So from me, Conal Moran, buchas to you all, agus slán tamal. 